You guys, uh, I'm so grateful for volunteers like Abby. Um, we're, we're all, you know, normal people. We got normal stuff going on, life going on. And man, church doesn't happen. And our, we're not able to impact the community if we don't have people who are willing to give time and, and serve others. And so people who set up the chairs, people who have the sound uh, and lights and run all that stuff. We, we got people leading worship. Um, we got people back um, watching the kids, I'm told. Um, they should be back there. Um, I thank you guys for all that you do. And uh, it just uh, it makes me so, so grateful. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, mention at the beginning here today that um, we normally have a guy named Michael Rabb who's leading our worship. And uh, uh, he and Kenny have been looking forward to having a little girl. And so he and his wife, Kenny, are actually today in the process of having that little one. And we're so excited. Um, I'm just, we've got people that are, they just love the Rabs. And so I just want to pray for them, uh, pray for that health and safety of both uh, mama and, little, and the little one. And uh, they do have a, a name, but it's top secret. It's an amazing name. It's, um, it'll blow your mind if you heard it, but I can't tell you because it's under, it's under lock and lid. But let's pray for them if you would. Father God, I just want to thank you for the raps. Thank you for Mike and Kenny. And we are so excited. We look with joyful anticipation to getting to meet this little one. Lord, would you protect her? Would you keep her safe? Would you keep Kenny safe in the, in the birthing process? Would you take care of um, their needs? Would you help Michael to be able to serve and to support every way possible, even if it's giving his hand to be crushed? By his wife, as she goes through this, Lord, we pray that you would be with them and give the doctors wisdom. And, um, and Lord, if there's any, any kind of complication, would you just give a great insight to the doctors on dealing with that? And Lord, bring people, put people around them to support and love them. Let them feel your presence in this amazing moment in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin uh, today with a story. It's an ancient story. Um, and it goes like this. In an ancient land, an ancient kingdom that had had many famines, um, poverty had struck, and there were, people had very little, and many people were in want. And in this uh, land, there was this beggar who was walking from village to village, going from home to home, knocking on homes, and before he could even say anything, a door would be slammed in his face because no one wanted to give up what they had because food was scarce, resources were scarce. Um, oftentimes people would see him coming and they would shut the, the, the window shutters and they'd shut the doors and they would act like they weren't home and he would just keep walking. Well, there was one home, one little shack in this village that the beggar came to and he knocked on it and it opened up just a little bit. And before he could get a word out, it says, we don't have any food here, we don't have any room here. And right before it could slam, he put his foot right in the door. Boom. And through the crack, he said, I'm not asking for anything. I actually have something to give. So the door opened a little bit more. And there was the face of a man that came out and he said, the beggar said to the man, he said, I want to give you the greatest meal in all the land. The, the man looked, he said, what, you, you're, you have nothing. You're a beggar. You've, you're wandering around. I've even heard of you. Like, what do you have to offer? He's like, I can offer you the greatest meal that's ever been made in this land. And where everybody has not enough, I can give you something that would satisfy. It's, it's amazing. He's like, well, tell me more about this. Come in. So he come in. He wasn't threatening or anything like that. So he brought him into his home. And, and he said, well, this is what it is. I can make you this uh, amazing meal. And it's called stone soup. Stone soup, he said. I've never heard of that. What, what kind of food is that? Well, he's like, I can't really describe it to you. It has to be experienced. Experienced. So what, what do we have to do to have this? Can you, can you make this for us now? He said, yes. And he pulled out a stone from his pocket. He says, uh, I've got the main ingredient, um, but I need, I need a, a few things. I, 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 a pot would be helpful. He said, well, we have a pot. Um, he sent his son to go grab a pot, and he brought, brought it to him, and he put the stone right in the pot. He said, but I also, uh, it would be great to have a, f a fire and some water. I don't know if you could, if you could spare that. I mean, yes, we could, we could get a fire going. So they got a fire going, stoked it up hot, um, and then got water in the pot and put it on that fire. And eventually it began frothing and boiling, and um, that pot was ready for food. And he said, so can we have the stone soup? And um, he said, well, the, we could have it, but there's a few things I need to work on it. If we could get these things, it would make it the most amazing thing. It would make it better than I've ever made it before. So what are those things? He's like, well, carrots would be really good. 
He's like, well, carrots are one thing we have. And so he went and chopped up some carrots and brought it to the, the, the beggar, and the beggar took it and threw it in the soup. And he's like, is it going to be ready? He's like, it's almost ready. There's, uh, it would just be amazing, though, if we could get, you know, some tomatoes. He's like, well, I don't have any tomatoes. Like, no one has tomatoes in this village. By that time, though, the villagers had heard because the kids, his son and daughter, who had gone and gotten, you know, the water and the wood for the fire, had told their friends, and they'd gone and told their parents. And all the villages started hearing about this man who was making the most amazing meal in the land. And they actually had gathered around the house. They were looking through the windows, and they were listening through the cracks in the, in the door to what was going on. And, you, and all of a sudden, an old lady said, I've got some tomatoes. She hobbled home and came back and brought some tomatoes and they cut them up and they put them in the soup. And uh, he's like, oh man, it is so, I mean, this would just be amazing. He's like, but I've always wanted to try something in this amazing meal in this stone soup. Does anybody have any chicken or pork? And everybody kind of looked around. Nobody had, you know, good meat around these days. But there was one little boy that was there, and he's like, my father does, and it was the butcher's boy. And he ran, and he told his father, he's like, we have to have the most amazing meal. And the, his father came fully skeptical, but then started smelling the aroma and, and saw all the people gathered, and he actually had both chicken and pork. And all the vegans in the village were very sad as they <laughs> threw it into the pot. And he said, are we ready? And he's like, yes, it's all ready, except does anybody have any salt and pepper? You know, and there was one old man that took out of his pocket some pepper. He's like, why do you have pepper in there? For good luck. And he just put it into the pot. And then finally it was ready. He says, all right, it's ready. And the man of the house, the one who owned the house, they looked at him, the beggar looked at him and said, would you try this soup? And you tell me if it's, if it's the best in all the land. And so they got him a bowl and they scooped the soup in. They gave it to him. They waited, he waited for it to cool down a little bit. And he took his first sip of the soup. And it just got really quiet in the house. And all the neighbors and the village was all gathered around. They're looking in. He says, this is the best soup I've ever had. And that's the end of the story. How many of you guys have heard that before? Story of stone soup. And these are, this is a parable. This is a parable. And wisdom is given from person to person, often through parables, proverbs, or principles. And there's meaning that's locked in these stories that can seem so silly or, you know, juvenile or unimportant. But there's these truths that can be locked in these parables. And the key is learning to figure them out. And we're jumping into a series that's called Wisdom and How to Find It. And, and actually, every week, I'm gonna, I, I want to tell a parable at the end of every sermon. And, I, and the, that parable is actually a key to what I'm going to be talking about the next week. And it's for you to figure out what I'm going to be talking about. What does that parable mean? And so when I give a story like I just gave, I want you to try to figure it out and message me on Facebook or message us, uh, Whitewater Church, on Facebook and, and see if you can, if you can uh, um, um, elucidate. It's a fancy, fancy word, but if you can interpret the meaning of that parable, and the person that has the best answer, I'm going to have a prize for them every week, okay? So I'll choose. If you, have the, if you nail it or get really close to it, we'll get you a prize. That's going to be every week. But um, parables, there's something about them when you hear them. They kind of rattle around in your brain. It kind of creates a question. It's like a riddle. It's a puzzle. And, and we learn something about it. In fact, in that, in that parable I told, told you guys earlier, what is the meaning of that parable? The cool thing is in parables, there's like layers of meaning. And one might look at that story and say, well, what I get out of it is that if you're really smart, you can trick foolish people into giving you food. But if you were to look a little deeper into that parable, I think you might find that what it's really getting at is this reality that when a world is living in scarcity and everyone's trying to protect what's theirs and, and protect what's mine and, and no one has enough, when we come together as community and throw what we have in the pot, like there's plentiful, there's an abundance. And it, here's the other thing, everybody has something to throw in the pot. We need one another. Relationships, community is vital to a healthy uh, life. Are you with me on that? So that parable, I think, is so powerful. And uh, each week, uh, over the next month, we're going to be looking at a specific um, uh, area of wisdom that I think our world and the world we live in uh, it would be really helpful for us to leverage we're going to be looking at these topics and we're going to look at what the Bible has to teach us on wisdom that God would want us to live 
um, wisely. Now, wisdom is this idea, the ancient Jewish tradition, wisdom, um, it, it, it really is the idea of taking uh, knowledge and then transferring it into our life. So it's taking information and turning it into application, wise application, applying the right knowledge at the right time in the right way. So uh, not taking a rake and, and trying to rake leaves with the, the stick end, but actually with the rake end. Like there's wisdom when you actually learn how to use a tool the right way at the right time. You also don't want to be raking out in your yard if there's no leaves out there. That might sound really silly if you ever saw someone trying to rake something with just the stick end and there's no leaves out there. You'd be like, that's crazy because they're not applying wisdom. Make sense? So the Bible is given to us to help us learn how to use the tools and the gifts of God in the right way at the right time. In fact, the beard um, in ancient times became a symbol of wisdom. Did you know that? Like the beard, like anybody with a beastly beard out here right now? Beastly beards. There's one right there. I like that's pretty beastly. There's a few. I think we can continue working on that over this series. Um, but... Um, um, I remember being a kid one time riding with my grandma and I looked up, I was like four, three or four and I looked up and she was taking me to their house and I looked up and I said to her, I said, Grandma, if you try harder, you could have a really good mustache. <laughs> and she knew that I meant it as a compliment because my dad had a good beard and um, I found out later that she got home and she was very nice. So thank you, Georgie, you know, for this compliment. And later she went and waxed her lip the next, <laughs> the next morning. She felt so bad. Uh, unaware, ignorant child. But the beard became this uh, symbol for wisdom. And what it symbolized was uh, it connected the head to the heart and the rest of the body. It connects the head to the heart to the hands. And wisdom is learning to live. It's the art of living a godly life. Um, In fact, in Proverbs, it says this, uh, chapter 1, Um, I'll I'll read up actually here. Proverbs chapter 1, starting uh, in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of King David, or uh, King David, the king of Israel. It goes on to say, for learning wisdom and discipleship. The purpose of Proverbs and parables is for learning wisdom and discipline. For understanding insight and sayings. Keep going. Verse 3, for uh, receiving prudent instruction in righteousness and justice and integrity. If you just stop there for a moment, there's a reality that the, the, the purpose of the Proverbs and wisdom in the scriptures is to help us live a life of righteousness, the right living, justice, and integrity. And going on in verse 4, it says, For teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, to the young, knowledge and dis, uh, discretion to a young man. Keep going. Let a wise person uh, listen uh, li- uh, listen and, cre- and increase learning, and let discerning a discerning person obtain guidance. It's interesting. Wise people, the wisest people I know, are the best learners, the best listeners. Wise people aren't the ones who are all going around, you know, dispensing like wisdom on people. And and, and it's, sometimes that happens. But the wisest people I know are always learning. They can learn from the least. They can learn from the people they're supposed to be teaching. They're always trying to learn. Um, wisdom takes that kind of humility. Um, it goes on to say, for understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and the riddles. And if you stop there for a moment in six, there's this reality that wisdom is contained and handed down from generation to generation through parables, through stories, so that we can learn from other people's mistakes. How many of you guys want to learn from other people's mistakes, not from your, your own? Now, it's good to learn from your own. It's bad to make a mistake and learn nothing from it. That's, de- that's foolish. But it's even wiser to learn from other people's mistakes or other people's successes and have that handed to us so that we can live successful lives. Here's the last verse. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. All wisdom starts, all right action, all like godly living starts with fearing and respecting and loving God. Does that make sense? And basically what it's saying is like there's a, you become wise and you have, a, an, a, you have access to becoming wiser when you realize that there is a God and I'm not him. There is a God and I am not him. I have a lot to learn. I'm not in control of everything. I don't know everything. 
I need God's wisdom in my life. And this series, the next uh, four weeks, is going to be about applying godly wisdom. How do we learn godly wisdom? And today, the, the, the wisdom I want to talk to you guys about is connected to the original parable of stone soup. The, the wisdom I want to talk to you guys about is the wisdom of community. And uh, what I'm going to do is I want to give you three biblical reasons why you shouldn't do 2018 alone. So many people in our culture are, are, are doing life alone or doing life on the fast track and they don't have time for community or they're seeking community in all the wrong places and the more they try to get connected on Facebook, the, the less connected they are and the more lonely people feel. And so I want to give you three biblical reasons and there's, uh, there's more than this. There's more reasons I'm giving you. I don't have time to dispense what I think are you know everything. But today, here in 2018, I want to give you guys three Biblical reasons to not do 2018 alone. The first one's this. You might want to take your notes out if you, if you have the notes that were handed out. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, we become who we hang out with. We become who we hang out with. How many of you guys know this is true? Now, another thing about wisdom in Proverbs, just another disclaimer, is they're not laws like gravity, like what goes up must come down, even though that's a good proverb, right? It's memorable. But when you, what goes up must come down. There's, when we're talking about wisdom, Proverbs or principles are general uh, truths, general principles that help guide our lives. You know, like generally speaking, people who work really hard, you know, like make money and take care of their family. But it's, it can be true that someone who's really lazy you know, who normally they can't provide and aren't doing anything and, and, they, and they should learn to have a work ethic. People who are lazy and don't like to work, um, occasionally they might like hit the jackpot and win a million dollars, you know, like that could happen. And it also is true that someone who works really hard and has planned their life really well and has a lot of integrity come on hard times. It's outside of their control. These are general truths to help us. And the general truth I want us to, to hit first is we become who we hang out with. Proverbs 13.20 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, but associate with fools and get in trouble. Saying we become who we hang out with. If you hang out and you surround yourself with people who are seeking wisdom, that have your best interest in mind, you are going to grow most likely. You are going to become wise because you're putting yourself in that environment, a growth, learning, wisdom environment. If you put yourself in an environment with people who are extremely intelligent, they're super smart, but they got no beards that connect their head to their heart. If they're people who haven't learned to take information and, and turn it into application. If, if, they've, if they're smart, but they make stupid decisions, and they're really unwise, then most likely if you spend all your time there, and you have your greatest influence on your life, you are going to be somebody who makes poor decisions. Some of you guys might be here today, and the 2017 was the, the year of terrible decisions. You might need to have to look within and look at the people you've been listening to. Who's been guiding your life? And the reality is we're either led up by the people we spend time with or we're led down. And I want you to, to put people around your life that lead you up to the best version of yourself that you can be rather than the worst version of yourself. Can I get an amen to that? That's important, you guys. I want this. For, don't do 2018 alone, but don't do it with people who make terrible, stupid decisions all the time. Now, when we're doing community, I got to give a few caveats here. I'm also not saying that, like, um, you know, uh, I'm not saying that community should become the, like the, the most important thing to you in, and replace God at the top. Does that make sense? Sometimes that can happen. I'm not saying that, like, oh, like I need a relationship, like a romantic relationship, that'll fix all my problems. No, not necessarily. Um, I had a friend who was an, an, an addict, and he was just realizing that he was addicted to this, um, to this substance in his life. And uh, he was talking with someone who had kind of overcome that addiction and had learned how to, to deal with that in a healthy way. And he said, look, you've been hanging out alone all the time. And the problem with that is that you're hanging out with an idiot. He was kind of like, it's like this slow burn of truth that he's like, that I needed to hear. Like, I need to be around people. But there's this reality that, that, that community, it can be helpful, but it also can lead you down. You have to be really careful. Um, it, so it's not just, I'm not saying that romantic relationships are the right answer for everything. I'm not saying that, um, I'm also not saying that people who need help, like, I can't hang out with you because, like, you do life and make, you make decisions I don't agree with. Sometimes we need to put ourselves in those 
places, and, we, and we're in workplaces or life places, family places, people who make terrible decisions all the time. And, and the key is not to allow yourself to get led down, but to be in that community to help lead them up. Does that make sense? All right? So with that caveat, we become who we hang out with. I remember being in, uh, teaching high schoolers. Uh, you know, in a real formative time in their teenage years, teaching them the principle, this principle, just telling them, like, your friends will determine the direction of your life. Remember, there was three guys hanging out there, and they were all dressed in black, and I, I taught this le- lesson. I was like, hey, remember, guys, who you hang out with determines the direction of your life. And they are like, what are you talking about, dude? And the other guy was like, what are you talking about, dude? And the third guy kind of looked at me, and he's like, yeah, what are you talking about, dude? It was just so funny. And they all, like, had the same piercing, all the same like painted black fingernails. They were all listening to the same techno music, kind of going like this. They all worked at the same McDonald's. <laughs> who you hang out with is who you become. It's a general truth to pay attention to in your life. Who is in your life that's leading you up and who's leading you down? And make wise decisions about that. The second thing is relationships make your life better. Relationships make your life better. Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 9, says this, two people are better. You know, like sometimes you hear these principles and you're like, that is so true and amazing, but it's just so obvious. And like, like, is that really helpful? Like, of course, two are better, right? And like, if you got a job to do, it's better to do with two than just one. But like sometimes the, the most obvious things, the obvious truths are ones that we ignore because for whatever reason, we're busy, we, life's going crazy, or I just want to do it my way. Any of you guys like that? I just want to do it my way. Ecclesiastes teaches us um, that relationships make your life better. Two people are better off than one. And then uh, here's just four quick brief points I want to hit very quickly. And this is in Ecclesiastes 9 through 12. It says, for they can help each other succeed. The first thing, you can write this under the second point, like in your notes if you want, is relationships or community, the community that's seeking wisdom together, brings success and help. We need people around us. We need people to, to help our lives. I remember like uh, Sarah was giving birth to Novella. We were at St. Joe's and we went in early because we didn't know if the contractions, like these were the heavy ones, either the real ones, or, you know, or we should stay home. We get in there and they're like, well, like you could have stayed home, but since you're here, we'll keep you for a few hours. And so we just walked for like hours around St. Joe. It's just the circular building. And as we're walking, Sarah's like, you know, as they come and like the, you know, the contractions come, and then she's hearing other ga- gals that are giving birth, like, oh my God, the pain, you know, just preparing her for what's to come and giving her confidence. And eventually we get in the room and Novella starts coming and like we start going through this whole process. She's crushing my hand and we're, and she's just like this silent, like, you know, just like I can take any pain and she's this tough gal. And finally Novella comes and we're exhausted. You know, I'm just so exhausted from the whole process. And, um, you know, my wife's tired. And we had these friends, Tim and Johanna Weaver. They showed up. And they didn't show up just to give us words of affirmation, which are great and super helpful and so encouraging. And they didn't come just, you know, like to wish us well. And they came and they prayed for us. But they also brought Frisco Freeze burgers. And it was like rebirth was happening. Like I was coming alive. If I'd been into this thing. I was like, oh. And I was like, Sarah, you're tired. I'm, I'm just going to eat the burgers over here. You can go to sleep. And she's like, give me the burger. <laughs> Relationships make your life better. And they bring you help. They bring you success. Number two in, this, in the second principle here is, um, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can, one be, how can one be warm alone? How can one be warm all by themselves? And this is, it seems so obvious, but it's so true. So many people are looking in all the wrong places, trying to get connected on, on the internet, uh, trying to get connected on their phone, trying to get connected through everything, and they're feeling more and more disconnected. And real authentic community brings warmth. It brings light. You ever been the, the kid that, that, that's at a new school and you come to the new school and you, you're in the cafeteria, you're in the classroom and you know nobody and you feel alone, 
isolated, it feels cold, and everybody's got friends, and everybody's going home to hang out with their friends, and they've got their groups at the school and at the recess, and you're, you're the, the one person that doesn't, have, you're picked last, you know, for the dodgeball or kickball. I remember being that, like, moving up from California, and there's this reality that relationships bring warmth, light, and life into our lives. Make sure that you don't do 2018 alone. You, it, we need each other. Number three in this passage is, um, starting in verse 12, it says this, a person, stands, uh, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and can conquer. I love that. Two can stand back to back and conquer and protect each other. Um, relationships provide protection. They provide accountability. They, pro- they provide like, the kind of help that protects your life. Um, if you've lost your job, if you have somebody, uh, close friends that are there to support you, they'll, they'll protect you, they'll take care of you, they'll be loyal to you, they won't abandon you. Real friends will, will stick with you through thick and thin. If you, you, your relationship blows up. And even when friends don't know how to handle it and your relationship's blown up or whatever, your marriage is blown up, you're, and maybe it's reconcilable, maybe it's not, your friends will still love you. And they'll speak truth to you, but they'll protect you. If there's slander or gossip going on around about you, if you've ever experienced that, where slander or gossip or something untrue is being said about you by other people, your friends will protect you. They'll, sh- they'll shut it down. They'll say, that's not true. You need to stop it. That's my friend. We don't, I, don't, I don't ever want to hear you say that about them. That's not true. You know, if there's stuff like that going around, friends protect each other. And one question I want you to ask is, are you a good friend to your friends? So we all want good friends for us, but are you a good friend for others? Because you will attract the type of person that you are becoming. Does that make sense? So this is just basic wisdom stuff, that protection thing. I, I remember the, the protection thing is so um, important to me like that, that it protects unity, it protects your life. I remember when Whitewater first started, I was out front and the church was about to start and and I was talking with this guy named Tony. Some of you guys might know him. Um, he's like six foot two, six foot three, former military, just this he's a strong guy. And, you know, he just has that kind of tough look. And I was talking with him at the front, and church is about to get started. And all of a sudden, I hear the screaming and yelling out across the road from where we were meeting at the school. And all of a sudden, there's like this domestic thing that happens. This guy is out in the front yard screaming at this gal, assuming his girlfriend or wife or something, and they're fighting, and it's getting like scary. So I'm like, you know, um, I'm a pastor. I got to do the godly thing and go preach about doing good things in the world. No, I like was like I can't do that. So I ran out across the road and I just and the guy was just screaming obscenities. It was it was a really scary situation. I was like, sir, you need to stop it. Calm down right now. I'm going to call the police. And the guy just turned and looked at me and just went off and started getting close, like up in my grill, and like something was going to happen. And you know, like like it should before you preach. You know what I mean? And uh, as a pastor. <laughs> And, uh, and I just said, sir, calm down. Like, I just calm down. And his eyes all of a sudden got really big when I just got, stepped forward. And he just like, kind of like, looked like he'd seen a ghost. And he started like, kind of stepping away. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, preacher. Like, I've got the Holy Spirit. And I kind of glanced behind me. And uh, Tony was standing there, all six foot <laughs> three of him, with like a cigarette just hanging off his lip. Looking like, a, like he stepped out of a Western, like as a gunfighter. He's like, you look like someone walked all over your grave. You know, I, he didn't say that, but the guy just immediately walked away, and I was like, oh. But man, like it's good to have friends. They protect you. And, it, and, and the last thing it says here is three is even better than, than, uh, than two. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken ecclesiastes starts in verse 9 two people are better and then it ends with actually three people are better what it's saying is more true friends are better and in that moment with tony myself and that and that gal who is you know being berated in public and it could have turned really messy and ugly um i became a i didn't know her but i became a friend really quickly but it was even better when a third friend came in when tony came in uh, more true friends are better. You guys with me? Don't do 2018 alone. Last point for you guys. Here's the last thing. Relationships are the currency of the kingdom of God. Relationships are the currency of the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Let me read you this parable that Jesus told. It goes like this. Luke 16, um, Jesus tells this parable. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. 
uh, handling his business. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. He was stealing, he was embezzling, he was wasting his money. Uh, he, was, he was unethical. In verse 2, the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about what you're doing? Get your report uh, in order because you're going to be fired. So the manager thought to himself, now what am I going to do? My boss has fired me. Uh, I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to, to beg. I know what I'll do to ensure that I have plenty of uh, friends who will t- who'll give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and, and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe the master? And the man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. And the manager, the sh- the, this wicked Shrewd manager told him, well, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And then there's another guy, guy there, and he says, how much do you owe my employer? He said, well, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, to which he replied, here, uh, take the bill and change it to 800. So he starts cutting the money down that they owe. Now the owner finds out about this, and the rich man, when he comes and sees what the manager's done, he's, he ha- it says he had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd what what and it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with this world around them than are the children of light saying sometimes people who live in the real world are more wise than people who follow jesus um, because they're not applying wisdom so what is he admiring in this guy like jesus isn't telling a parable that we should admire unethical terrible work ethic type of people people are, are who are doing that kind of stuff what he's saying is is something is something deeper that there's a quality that the man that the owner saw in the manager <clears throat> basically he's saying you know what that guy is unethical he, he's a lazy worker but at least he gets one important thing and here's the important lesson use your worldly wealth to benefit others and make friends then when your possessions are gone they will welcome you into eternal homes into, into heaven. And what he's saying is like the, the wicked, shrewd, conniving manager got one thing right. He knew that true wealth for him was not in money or in resources. It was in people. Relationships, people are the currency of the kingdom of God. Relationships, people are the treasure That's where the real treasure is. And so he says, use your worldly wealth. Use your homes. Use your money. Use your cars to bless and love people because that's where the value is. So I want to encourage you guys to not do 2018 alone. I want to encourage you to invest in the lives of people. Use your homes to invest in people. Use your your bank accounts, your lives, your time, your talent, your treasure to invest in people. Are you with me? Now, here's the challenge that I wanted to lay out for you guys. The challenge is this. Um, in February, we're going to be launching a, a church-wide campaign. It's a spiritual growth campaign designed <clears throat> for us to grow our faith, for you to grow your faith individually and us to grow our faith as a church. It's going to be based out of, the, out of Luke's writings, the guy who wrote Luke and Acts. We're going to base the series on that. What the heck? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the pastor just like looks over like, oh no. Um, someone just won in their fantasy. It was really great. So, um, But here's the challenge that I have for you guys. Um, with that said, we're going to be starting that in February. It's going to be uh, about growing your faith, and it's going to be seven weeks. And in this campaign, we were wanting to get more people in, in community and in relationships than we've ever had before so that we can grow together. So I want you to consider one of two challenges. First one being to join a group, to just be willing to join a group. We're not starting it now. You've got a month to think about it and pray about it, but to get into biblical community together so that we can grow in faith. And it's just a commitment of seven weeks. I'm not asking for your whole life. I'm not asking for the whole year, but just for those seven weeks to commit to getting in community and growing and seeing what God would do. Would do. Take the risk and jump into community. Now, the second um, challenge is this. It's host a group. <coughs> Well, I, like for us to really have more community than we've ever had before and for us as a church to grow in faith, we need people who are willing to open their lives, open their homes to host. And to host, you don't have to be a perfect person. You just have to be willing. Willing to open your home, open your RV, open your, you know, uh, your tent, 
your garage, whatever it may be, even if you're just willing to like host at a coffee shop for seven weeks with some people, gather some people up and grow in faith together. That's what we want to do. And so I want to put this challenge out there. We're praying for 35 new hosts, 35 new hosts, so that we can accommodate people that want to get into community and grow for seven weeks. It's only a seven-week commitment. And uh, if you, and it, I want you to be praying about it over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking for hosts, just people that would simply host it. You don't have to be like some amazing leader. We're going to get you the tools to be successful. We'll get you the resources to be successful. And if you're interested this, this week, you're interested in maybe hosting, this isn't signing you up or signing your life away. If you're interested, um, this week you can even write on a connection card, fill out a connection card. They're on the, on the um, seats around you. Or they're in the back and just fill out your information with contact info and then write the word host on the connection card and turn it in as the plate goes by or, the, or into the offering box in the back. And someone will contact you and we'll get you the resources to be successful. And, and you can even see if this is a fit. So just signing up on the connection card isn't saying you're committed, it's just saying you're interested, okay? So over the next three, if you're not ready to sign anything or send anything in uh, today, that's okay too. But over the next three weeks, we're looking for 35 hosts. Pray about it, think about it, and take the risk to host if you feel God calling you to do that. So those are the two challenges I have for you all. Don't do 2018 alone. I'm all done, but there's one more thing. I gotta leave you with the parable, all right? You guys gotta figure this out and then message me or message the church on Facebook if you, if you think you figured out the meaning of this for our sermon next week. Here's the parable. Uh, I, I, what I've gathered, this is a parable from India. So there were three Indian princes, and uh, they were sons of the king, and they went out into the jungle on a journey together, deep into the jungle. And as they were on this journey, uh, the first prince saw a claw on the ground, and he picked it up, and he kept it. And as they were going, the second saw something on the ground. As he got closer, it was a fang, and he picked it up, and he kept it. And then the third prince, as he was walking, he saw something, and he he got closer, and he gathered it up, and it was a patch of fur, and he kept it. And as they kept walking, they ran into a beggar deep in the jungle. I didn't even know how he got there, who had nothing. And they were exploring, and they were learning, and he had nothing to offer them. And as they were passing by, they mentioned that, look at, look at the beggar, he has nothing to offer. He says, oh, I have one thing to offer. And I said, what? He's like, I have a box. If you put whatever you have in this box, it will create something and bring it to life. So they uh, didn't ask. They just took the box away from him. And then they threw the fang, the fur, and the big tooth, or the, and the claw, into this, those three items. And as they threw them in, all of a sudden, they start, this movement started happening, and all of a sudden, the fur began to grow sinew and muscle and bone, and, and all of a sudden, the claws started having other claws, and there were, the fangs turned into a maw, like a big mouth, and all of a sudden, a lion jumped out of this box, full-grown male lion. And the princes looked at it in amazement. And then the lion ate them, all three. So what's the meaning of the parable? Figure it out and let me know. And I'll have a prize for the winner next week. Love you guys. Let me pray as we go uh, to sing. Father God, we love you. We want to commit ourselves to wisdom. We want to learn how to uh, learn the art of living godly lives. We love you. We're so grateful for you. I pray for anybody who's here who's hurting. God, would you lift the burdens off their shoulders and help them to seek wisdom for their life. In Jesus' name, amen.